Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is an episode about investment, and it's a discussion with Mark de Messel, who's an investor based in Europe. And Mark talks about some of the particular challenges uh, facing investors um, inside uh, Europe, but also um, the, the topics that we cover are relevant for investors anywhere, in particular for individual investors. I am a big fan of uh, managing my own investments, and I think it's the best approach for um, everyone uh, to manage their own investments, to understand their own investments. And Mark also um, is speaking as an independent individual investor. And just as I'm a big fan of uh, managing my own investments, I also think it's really important to uh, evaluate and decide for myself about investment strategies and investment criteria. And so I'd just like to point out that nothing in this podcast is any kind of qualified financial advice or anything of that nature. These are opinions provided by myself and Mark about investment. And I encourage you to evaluate um, for yourself the different strategies that we're talking about um, for investing your money and to come up with your own approach um, I think there's a lot of value to be found uh, in the permanent portfolio approach that we discuss in this podcast, as well as the focus that we have in this podcast on gold and precious metals in terms of potential speculations. So I in- encourage you to check out those ideas for yourself and other ideas around investment. Make your own decisions, and this is provided just for you as a discussion to um, encourage your thinking. So I hope you enjoy the episode and thank you so much for listening. I'm very pleased to have a guest with me today, a special guest, um, Mark de Messel, and he runs a blog on investing in Europe. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Jake. Thanks, thanks for uh, having me. Yes, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, would you like to tell um, the listeners the, the uh, URL of your blog, just uh, so yeah. we can make sure they can find that? Yeah, I have a, a, a Dutch blog eh, because I'm from Belgium, next to the Netherlands, so one in Dutch and one in English. And um, I think the English one is most uh, interesting for the English speakers, of course. Yeah. Um, and, and that's just... Um, is it a Euro- European Permanent Portfolio uh, in Google, and you have it first... Uh, uh, yeah, and my other blog yeah. is uh, the Dutch one, and that's just my name, .be, yeah. uh, from Belgium, yeah. so markdemezel.be. Cool. So maybe it would be interesting for a start um, just to, uh, to, to give people a little bit of your background, um, you know, and you, uh, in investing in particular, but also, you know, uh, sort of your, your experience with investing, how you came to, to be interested in investing. Yeah, well, I was lucky uh, to inherit money when I was, um, I think it was 20 years old. And um, uh, at first it was managed by the bank. Um, It it was still my grandfather that was making decisions about it. And uh, it was a disaster Uh, in the dot-com bubble. We had a neutral portfolio, uh, which means that it should be neutral, but it wasn't very neutral. Uh, it lost the 25% in two years. Right. And so that, that was my first experience with investing. Um, that would, together. That would have been the, the dot-com bust of um, sort of 2002. Would it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So so I was kind of... Before that, I also lost money myself by speculating on dot-com uh, companies with my savings. And it was also a total disaster. Um but um, yeah, that learned me like the hard way that uh, it's uh, not simple. So I started researching in 2003 after losing that a lot. Um, and I, uh, I, I uh, read the um, excellent book from Mark Faber, um, Tomorrow's Gold. And that's really an, has been an eye opener for me to understand the markets. Right. And then since uh, 2006, 2007, I got uh, the money myself. So I was, uh, my grandfather luckily decided to get it out of that bank and, um, and send it just to, to us. And uh, so we could then start investing ourselves. And um, 
Yeah, so I keep track of my record since 2007. Huh? Mm. And, um, and during the crisis, I didn't lose that much in 2008, yeah. um, which gave me confidence that I should do something in this uh, financial field. Um, and I started the blog in Dutch uh, in uh, 2009. Um, and uh, yeah, that is a very successful blog. Um, uh, it has uh, many articles and um, yeah, that's the story a little. Excellent. Now, you've taken an approach, um, which is a similar approach to the approach I take, uh, which is called the permanent portfolio. And I wonder if you could just um, explain um, for people who are less familiar with it, um, you know, what that what that means. Yeah, it means uh, it's um, it's the only it's a really defensive portfolio, meaning it's the only defensive portfolio that has proven that it will preserve your purchasing power in every economic climate. Huh? So, and that's very unique. Yeah? So this permanent portfolio is just a simple um, hedging technique to have di four different assets, uh, gold, uh, stocks, bonds, and cash. And if you have four, all four of them, it's true that in every climate, one of them does very well and um, makes up for the losses in the other um, assets. Yeah. And by any climate, you mean anything that could be happening in the economy, whether it's a boom or a recession or an inflationary period or even a, a depression. Yeah, that's right. Um, and that's very unique. So I also myself uh, went over these numbers very intensive. And um, so what happened in Japan uh, with the permanent portfolio? And that's a very unique climate, especially in the 90s. Um, and it uh, went down dramatically. It was a true deflation there. Mm. And um, yeah, it was a total disaster. Uh, it's even 20 years in a row now. But it, the PP still, uh, I maintained your purchasing power, but stocks went down by, I think it was 40, 50%. Mm. Let me see the numbers. But the real estate also. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and when you say you, you ran the numbers, what, what I think you mean is that you've looked at the various asset classes and constructed, back-tested um, the permanent portfolio in different countries to show if you had followed this strategy of having um, a, a, a balanced portfolio between different asset classes and then rebalancing 25%, what would your return have been in Japan or in Europe and so forth? Is that what you mean by having looked at the numbers? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I wasn't very clear. Yeah. So, so um, yeah. Uh, well, other people did that, uh, like Craig, uh, for the US. Uh, he did that very well from 1972 to uh, 2011. Uh, the returns and um, um, yeah, it has been nine percent, nine point eight percent on average, which is very good. But mm. it's not just the last decade. It's every decade, also during the 90s, 80s, 70s that you have this at least 7% a year on average. Mm. Um, so that's very good. Uh, but indeed, I ran the numbers myself for Europe, mm. uh, which was also uh, good uh, on average 6% the last 10 years and didn't uh, lose only 1%, 2% in the dot .com. Mm. Eh? So mm. that's very good. But especially Iceland, uh, I did also, and that's very interesting because you have many people today thinking that, especially people that invest almost everything in gold, they say that, um, well, if we get this total disaster and uh, the currency collapses completely, then stocks, bonds, and cash will become worth worthless. Mm. Um, and so you lose 75%. That's, that's what they say, but that's not true because in that climate, like Iceland, yeah. <laughs> where that happened, yeah. uh, what you see is that, yes, indeed, stocks lost 90%, like 95%, so that was gone. Mm. And indeed also bonds and cash uh, went down in true value like enormously because the currency lost 200% uh, of its purchasing power in one year. Mm. Hmm? Yeah. But gold in Iceland went up for 200%. Huh? So I'm making up gold, the loss. Yes, it, the, the, the end result was that you still had 40% with that permanent portfolio in Iceland. Mm thanks to um, uh, gold huh? yeah. and that means that in Iceland 
Um, uh, real estate, for example, didn't went up any, didn't go down, but didn't go up neither. Right. So if you with your PP did still 40 percent versus real estate, you can buy now 40 percent more real estate. Eh? Mm. Yeah. So that's what happened with the permanent portfolio in Iceland. So. And I think the same will be true in the US eh, or anywhere else. Mm, huh? Absolutely. Well, I think this is it's really interesting to hear your experience because, um, you know, uh, the permanent portfolio, as you as you describe, has, has, has been an approach which um, Harry Brown uh, developed. And we talked about it on the show before to really, um, in a sense, hedge against whatever the government does to um, to mess around with the money supply um, and, and the impacts that, that can have on the economy. Now, you're in an interesting situation because you're obviously investing in the Eurozone. And so um, I thought it would be interesting to talk through with you your approach to investing in the Eurozone, and particularly in these times when the Euro looks incredibly shaky and, you know, it's an interesting situation to be in. So um, what I was going to suggest, or what I would like to ask you is, is really just to run through your approach to investing in Europe. And so, for example, when it comes to investing in the stock market, there are many different approaches to, to picking stocks, and the permanent portfolio has a very particular approach. Uh, could you describe your approach to investing in stocks, and what do you, what do, you do? Because obviously you live in Belgium, but you're in the Eurozone, so what stocks do you invest in? Yeah, I, um, I I take the Eurozone stocks, eh? so I have just, uh, right now it's an ETF uh, from iShares with uh, the Eurozone stock index. Um, yes, I index do. representing the entire um, EU zone, is it? Or yeah. Is it, is oh, oh. It, does it include the UK? Um, is it no, uh, it's Eurozone, meaning only the countries that have the Euro as a currency. Huh? Right, right. And it's an uh, index. You're not investing, you're not picking stocks, trying to pick market um, beaters. You're just investing in the stock market as a whole. Yes, yes, yes. I am among the hardcore Harry Brown uh, uh, advocates. So... Um, uh, he makes everything very simple. The stocks is also just an index fund, and you really need to have an index fund, not a managed fund. So I don't do that. So indeed, I have just uh, the index. Yeah, well, also, I think you have the direct experience of how badly it can go wrong with a manager because you had a managed fund at the bank, mm -hmm. right? And you, as you were saying, you, that they they picked what seemed in 2000 uh, to be you know uh, just a, a ridiculously good deal to get uh, these um, growth stocks these internet boom companies and 2002 um, you know it really or 2001 it really really hit yeah absolutely uh, but the thing is that i just i have also tried other uh, stuff just not just the bank because of course they are not good but i also try to follow other uh, I, Good investors, and I think it's very difficult. I, I, I just know many famous investors have uh, lost a lot of money. Um, and, and if you look at uh, track records, uh, for example, Hulbert uh, has an excellent report. Uh, he follows for 30 years now, uh, today, uh, 300 newsletters and their portfolios, uh, 500 portfolios, and he tracks them. And it's quite shocking how few portfolios perform better than the permanent portfolio. Yeah. It's in, 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 I have the numbers here. It's in 20 years, if you look at 20 year track record, mm. there's only, uh, I've only found one, one wow. Wow. of the 300. And you would think statistically there should be a couple just, just on pure chance. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's for some, it's 30 years. So, but on the track on a uh, 20, 20 years, mm. 25 it's just one so that's really very very bad you know yeah, yeah, yeah. um but if you look at the last 10 years eh, from those 300 you do have i think it's around 20 eh? right. but it's still only 20 eh? yeah. um so the the pp eh, does has a yeah a very good uh, uh return of the last 10 years it's uh, eight percent per year mm. um and only 20 newsletters did better than that, and 280 did worse, you know? Yeah. So if you're going to speculate, um, I think uh, it's, uh, you have to do it in your variable portfolio, and you have to know that it's hard. Hmm? Yeah. Now, there are people who, who uh, really take an indexing approach to the stock market, and they only invest 
in the market as a whole, like like the permanent portfolio. And they, you know, they they would very much agree with you that um, there's no point in trying to pick winners because it's just uh, so unlikely to work that you're better off taking a, an index of the whole market and gaining from from the gains that the market makes as a whole. However, your approach, as far as I understand, if it because uh, I know you follow the permanent portfolio approach, is to diversify not just in terms of diversifying across the whole stock market, but also diversifying into other asset classes that a lot of people, you know, if you were just starting out investing, may never have even thought of or, you know, would, would not um, dream of, like gold, for example. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I wanted to ask about um, your experience of investing in gold within uh, the European community. I, I certainly found that you know, it's still a pretty uh, small minority. It's getting bigger and bigger, but it's still a pretty small minority of people who invest in actual physical gold. Mm-hmm. Uh, has that been your experience in, in uh, Belgium as well? Um, yes, it's uh, quite uh, disappointing, I must say. Um, I have been uh, uh, talking about uh, buying gold and silver since 2003, uh, four, when I read uh, Mark Faber's book. Mm. And um, and still today, many people uh, that I know in my family, they still haven't bought gold. It's just, it's just totally absurd, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I think many many investors uh, still don't do it. But I must say there is there is a, a good um, uh, access to gold and silver here uh, in Belgium and the Netherlands. So that's true. Is that right? And, mm-hmm. and you do you recommend buying actual uh, physical coins, or what is your your approach? For my permanent portfolio, I just did bullion vault. Right. Um, I I know it's not physical, but uh, they buy it physical. I believe them. Mm. Uh, and um, yeah, um, but I do have next to that, like I only have half of my. Uh, capital in the permanent portfolio the other half is in my variable portfolio Mm. where i speculate and there i also have gold uh, but that gold is physical and so i I buy it physically put it in in a bank vault myself eh? right Uh, right. (laughs) cool yeah that's another approach is to sort of make a clear distinction between what you're doing uh, as far as a permanent portfolio where you have kind of a, a strict rules about rebalancing and keeping a very balanced portfolio and then obviously as you say you have like a variable portfolio where you you follow your own uh thoughts or theories or instincts about where you think you might uh, be best to invest yeah but with money that you uh you know you you can potentially lose but still not not be uh you know too damaged by it so to speak well, I still I do speculate with half of my money. So if it goes bad, I will lose half. So I will not. I, I mean, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that because that would I, I think a lot of people who follow the permanent portfolio would consider losing half to be too too much of a risk. So what what's your thoughts about why why have you chosen fifty fifty? Yeah, well, um, that's because I think some of the claims in the by Harry Brown. And uh, that are also in the PP community today, I, I don't agree with. Huh? Um, for example, uh, you know, many times there is that fu- the future is uncertain. You don't, you can't know what will happen. Huh? Mm. Um, like um, it's useless huh? uh, to, to, to predict, try to predict the future. I don't agree with that at all. Huh? There are many, uh, many, in percentage wise, few, but in people, numbers, I know several people, and they are gurus, so everybody knows them, that do very well. Huh? Right. And um, they predict the future, and they do that job very well. Huh? And they have track records that really do outperform the permanent portfolio. Huh? Um, the one I am following, he has uh, an average of 20% per year, huh? right. and the permanent portfolio only has six here in Europe. So, I mean, that's worth uh, the bet, you know? Mm, interesting, interesting. Cool. Well, um, so th- that's interesting. Now, um... Yeah, the thing is this, you know, the, the speculation, what is that? Of course you cannot predict the future, but that's not what you do when you speculate. When you speculate, you weigh your chances. Huh? Mm. And you go through scenarios and you think, okay, this scenario 
has a very high chance of, of, of happening versus this scenario has a very low chance. Huh? Mm. And so what I'm thinking right now is a scenario huh, that, um, uh, that uh, the crisis will become worse, that uh, there will be a lot of money printing, that money will continue to flow out of real estate, out of government bonds and versus gold. I think those chances are very high. Huh? Mm. So I say nine in 10, this will happen. Whereas prosperity, uh, that uh, the crisis will stop uh, or uh, the, the, the worst will be, uh, and now uh, starting tomorrow, uh, they stop uh, money printing, banks uh, start doing well. I mean, yeah, that's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have some technological breakthrough, like cheap energy or something like that, yes, that can happen. But those chances are very low, mm -hmm. uh, I think. It's only one in 10. Uh, so I'm not gonna bet on that scenario. But it can happen, you know? Yeah. And if it happens, I've bet 50% on it. If it happens that we get prosperity, yes, I will lose that 50%. Eh? Mm. But it's still a good bet. It's yeah. still worth trying, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I understand exactly what you're saying. Now, <laughs> that's the interesting thing, though, is you've talked about your, your thoughts about what's likely to happen um, in terms of, uh, you know, the way that government um, printing of money, uh, inflation is going to happen and so forth. But that brings us on to the other two asset classes. And this is something that especially people who are heavy gold investors just can't get their heads around why you would ever want to put these these two asset classes in your permanent portfolio, because they're both essentially government money. Um, and it's it's it's, it's I, it, the two remaining classes are cash and long term government debt or bonds. So I'm very interested to hear, you know, your thoughts as a an investor who um i think you're coming at this from a sort of austrian economics perspective of understanding what happens when the government prints money so what what would you say to the people who say well what are you doing you know with having these assets that you think are about to get completely decimated by government uh actions what are you doing holding them in your portfolio yeah well uh if um uh... I think indeed nine chances in 10, those will be destroyed. Eh? Uh, but there is this, still this one chance in 10 that uh, it won't happen, eh? so that we get prosperity again, eh? and that uh, the government is able to pay it back all, and that uh, we, we get good feelings again, so that cash you get interest again, maybe four or 5%, because there is no printing. So there is true bank lending again, and so they have to pay interest. And then the bonds, well, since everything is going well, uh, people, uh, yeah, the, the interest rate can also continue to go down, mm. um, uh, so or stay low, huh? mm. uh, and that way. Uh, and my gold in that scenario would lose 50% uh, in 10 years. Huh? Mm. So um, the, in that scenario, which is only one in 10, but in that scenario, I will really need them, you know, mm. uh, to uh, to uh, preserve my purchasing power. But I also want to add something else, Jake, about um, gold, because especially gold books, I know it's not a beautiful name, eh? but um, it's people eh, that believe that um, it is, I think they make a lot of mistakes eh? in, in their argumentation. Eh? For example, gold is money. Eh? They start with that. Eh? Gold is money and it preserves your purchasing power long term, always. Eh? That's their claim. Eh? Yeah. But this is not true. Uh, gold has lost an enormous amount of purchasing power in 50 years from 1950 till 2000, for example, versus real estate, you know? Mm. Um, it has been a total disaster. Huh? Uh, gold uh, during the 80s and 90s lost in dollar value like 90% of its purchasing power in 20 years, mm. you know? So, so, I mean, if they say long term, it will always come back. Well, I hope they do mean 40, 50 years and not 20, because that's not true. Huh? Right. Yeah, certainly the 80s and 90s. I think anybody who had lived through the 70s, um, like people like Harry Brown, who were making uh, serious money from gold in the 70s, it must have been a big surprise um, when the 80s and 90s hit and gold just suddenly lost so much value. And I wonder if that's one of the reasons why Harry um, invented or, or at least refined the permanent portfolio, because 
he definitely made a lot of money out of gold in the 70s. And then the eight, as soon as the 80s hit, uh, as you say, uh, relative to other asset classes, it was a bit of a disaster. Yes, um, indeed. And um, I think also Harry Brown, that was very clear in his books he wrote at the start of the 80s, when he first launched his permanent portfolio ID, it was so like, clear to me that it was to try to rescue his many Goldberg friends that were totally uh, into it and just didn't see it just uh, happening. And so they were fully loaded on gold, of course. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then it was 10 years in a row a disaster. And if they then didn't change their minds, it was another 10 years a total disaster. Huh? Mm. See, I think gold... <laughs> isn't money anymore today mm. and that's why the value of it can go up so much and down so much it has become a asset class you mm. know and people buy it sometimes uh, everybody wants it and other times they all sell it you mm. know um, it's it's an asset class and so uh, the thing is also that <laughs> Uh, there is a contradiction. So they say, uh, Goldbergs then, eh, I want to buy gold uh, because it's safe. Eh, um, and when the shit ha uh, hits the fan, I will still have my money. But that's not true. You will not just have still your gold. Mm -hmm. You will have become rich, you know. If the shit hits the fan, if your predictions happen, you will become rich with your gold. It will go up 300% in, in purchasing power in one year. Eh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so and 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 that's they don't uh, seem to like re, they don't like to say that because the, that also means that if it doesn't happen their prediction they will lose 90% of their purchasing power and that they never like to hear or say or it's just not possible you know and i think that's the difficult thing about it about gold is um i like you i think the likelihood of uh well, essentially hyperinflation uh, at some point is pretty high now, is scarily high. But when is that going to happen? It's very, very hard to, uh, to, to judge. And, you know, if it happens in six months, then uh, having all, uh, the majority of your investment in gold makes a lot of sense. If it happens in six years, uh, then it doesn't necessarily make sense. And if it doesn't happen at all, it could, it, it, for another 10 years, then uh, it could leave you very, very heavily exposed. Yes, that's right. Th that's right. Yeah. I also think that the, the permanent portfolio, if even let's say you're a Goldberg, eh, but you do it for the right reasons. Eh, you believe that it's a good speculation and you want to just uh, put it all in and, uh, and uh, take your chances. Then still, I think the permanent portfolio has a lot of value for you because this is finally a solution that will preserve your cash value. And so it's indeed, as an investor, always interesting to have some on the sidelines when you have serious corrections, which can happen with gold still also. Mm, yeah. and, and if you don't have money to, to buy more, that's very good. But most of them don't want to put money on the side because it's just savings accounts. They give 0 or 1% interest, and they know that true inflation is 5 6 7%. So it's just too bad, you know, it's just... Yeah. Too bad, but if you have a PP, you do have that six percent, seven percent, and it's it does um, preserve its purchasing power in the economy. Huh? Mm, um, and cash is useful because you can, as you say, you can you can do stuff with it. When op investing opportunities come around, then you have cash to actually take advantage of it. Yes. But I wanted to ask again about your thoughts on on Europe because you so you're holding within your portfolio, you're holding cash, and you're holding long term bonds. And from my understanding, your your view would be that, um, well, let me ask you actually, first of all, what do you think is going to happen to the euro currency now? And how do you see things playing out? Yeah, so that, that would be my prediction then. Um, uh, I'm going to maybe answer that later, but I want to say about my European permanent portfolio. So that my bonds, mm. they are German bonds I have and my cash. They are also German bonds, uh, but of course, uh, sure. one is 30 years, the other one is uh, only a, uh, like one year eh, or less. Now, you've chosen German. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that's interesting. So what is your thinking about why have you done that given the size of the euro um, currency zone? Why have you just chosen German? Yeah, I've chosen them because I did the, 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 the yields, the returns. And when I just took, uh, I um, 
the bonds of the eurozone, mm. uh, just uh, all of them uh, in some kind of index funds, and it exists, uh, then it's just too low. Um, they aren't strong enough. For example, in 2008, these German bonds, they gave 18%. But if I took a Eurozone uh, index, yeah, so all of the bonds of Eurozone, it was only, I, if I remember correctly, maybe 10 or, or 8%. So, But that means that the Eurozone, like the pyramid portfolio, had a loss of minus 3%. Yeah? And that was with the German bonds. But if you would have the Eurozone bonds, it would have been more, probably minus 5% or something. Yeah? So you see that the German bonds... It's it's the, the strongest bonds, eh? mm -hmm. um, uh, so so we really need them um, to, because the the shares drop everywhere uh, as hard, um, equally hard. So, but the bonds not. Now it's a very interesting choice because it, uh, there's a couple of things about that. I mean, with the bonds themselves in the portfolio, the idea of long-term bonds is that during a deflationary event. Um, that uh, investors will rush into whatever they seem, see as most secure, um, providing a return in the long term. And that's the, the longest investment, and most um, sort of secure that you can get um, is, is long term government bonds, um, because governments can always print the money to actually uh, um, uh, uh, pay them. Now, the interesting thing is that um, in the in the US and in the UK in 2008 there was a deflationary event and money did rush into bonds and they did play a very strong role in helping the permanent portfolio nobody nobody expected especially in the 2000s you know who would have expected that we would have had deflation given that uh, you know there's there's so much uh, inflationary pressure in all the money printing but when the recession hit that's what happened um, and the bonds did uh, really imp play an important role in carrying the portfolio. Now, the interesting thing is that when you choose German bonds, what I'm thinking is, is it the case that for a deflationary event where investors in the eurozone are rushing to the government uh, debt, like long-term government-supported investments, i.e. government debt, maybe the German ones, because Germany is kind of the engine of the european economy maybe that is why those german bonds are are you know uh, what you're choosing as opposed to an index which would cover you know greek national debt and other countries where um it just it, the where it's just obvious that the government is not going to be able to support their currency is that do you think that's what's going on uh yes absolutely uh the germany is the second best, um, financially speaking. Um, uh, so it's the Netherlands is even better. But the problem is, people don't know the Netherlands, the bonds from the Netherlands so well than the bonds, the Bund from Germany. Mm -hmm. So indeed, most eurozone investors that are now fleeing from uh, Gre bonds from Greece and Italy and Spain, they uh, flee to the uh, German bon Bund. Eh? Mm -hmm. So it's 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 and so the prices go up even more for the German bond than the bond from the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, and but last year it was a shock again. It's true what you say, Jake, that uh, in 2008 nobody expected that bonds would go up so dramatically. Eh? Mm. Uh, that's true. And then when it happened, after that. Of course, they then all said, yeah, well, that will have been the last time. Now it's going to totally collapse. Eh? Uh, bonds. And then in 2011, <laughs> they went up again. <laughs> yeah, in 2011, they went up even more than in 2008. Yeah. And that's not because 2009 and 2010 was bad. Eh? No, they also went up with five. Like in Europe, uh, it lost minus 2% in 2009, that's true. But in 2010, it was 13%. And in 2011... Last year it was nineteen point four percent. So the best asset. Hmm? It's fascinating, um, isn't it, that um, that last year bonds. Again, who would have thought that in 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 these times when you know we are surrounded by it's even becoming more mainstream to worry about uh, what the effect of all this quantitative easing is going to be and inflationary pressures and stuff. People are starting to wake up to it, and you know people who are heavy gold investors. Um, you know, have have always, I think, looked at the idea of investing in long-term government debt as being 
just an insane proposition. And yet, as you say, since 2008, really, really strongly performing. In 2011, you know, the the um, strongest performing. In, or is that the case in the European portfolio anyway? Was it? Yes, but in, in the American one, it's still worse. It's plus 33%. It's really an amazing performance. So, but in, 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 in the Eurozone, like most of them, co- a lot of them collapsed. In Italy, Greece, it's a total mm. nightmare if you would have those bonds. Yeah. But indeed, the German bonds still in 2011 went up a lot. Mm. Um, and it's true, they might start falling also for the long term, eh? starting next year. That's true. But then, very, very likely, some years it will still do very well. Eh? Yeah. Because even when it is in a bear market, it just comes back sometimes a little. Huh? Yeah. And, and, and in those years, typically, it's the inverse for the other ones. So let's say stocks or gold go up that, uh, normally. Well, that year, probably not. Huh? Yeah. And so you will also then need those German bonds uh, or just bonds in general to even when it is it in a bear market, still it adds value to your stability of your portfolio. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Now, um, yeah, that, thank you for, for sharing. That's very interesting to hear your approach about the bonds within the Eurozone, because I was wondering what European investors would do um, with regard to that. And I should imagine that, you know, the first place you would look would be an index fund covering the whole European currency, because that would be sort of the Harry Brown safety a- approach. But I can also understand why you've chosen the German bonds. And it actually kind of makes sense in terms of the logic of why you hold them in the account. Um, to provide for that stability during a deflationary event. Um, So, yeah, that's really interesting to hear your approach on that. Yeah, the thing is that that if uh, Europe would start uh, creating bonds, eh, so the European Parliament, then I think I will have to change. But, you know, today, yeah, it's not like... You don't have to have them all. You have to have the strongest, just like Harry Brown yeah. wanted the strongest bond in the U.S. Eh? Yes, absolutely. And, and that, was, that was from the state. But he could, he, it could uh, yeah, he didn't choose the bonds from the states. He chose it from the country. Eh? Yes. Um, but there is no country here. There are only states. And then you have to choose the strongest one. Eh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it makes sense. Let me ask you about cash um, and particularly about holding euros because, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion about what the future of the euro is and you're holding um, euros in your uh, in your investment portfolio, euro denominated investments. And in particular, you know, you've got cash investments in short term, short term um, government debt um, that's denominated in euros. How do you see this playing out? Um, it like do you what what do you think is going to happen? What what would it even mean for the euro to break up? What would happen to you know to the different well different people in different countries uh, who are currently holding euros? Yeah, well, uh, if it would happen, uh, the breakup. Eh? So let's say Greece uh, tomorrow decides to um, get out of the euro, uh, has its drachmas again. Or they will give it another name. That's for sure, <laughs> not drachmas. But um, uh, let's say they decide to do that. What will happen is the currency, whatever they create, will immediately drop a lot in value, um, unless they just make it valueless th- themselves. But then the purchasing power of the Greece people will also go down eh, by decision. Then, eh? um, uh, so presumably, we'll have to provide some official conversion rate from euros into the new currency so they're going to say well it's one to one or whatever and then as yeah. you say i should imagine that immediately um after, upon official conversion the value will will just drop um through the floor yeah it's yeah that's what i'm thinking it, 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 that's the problem for the Greece today. The euro is way too strong. Eh? Uh, so their prices are dropping from real estate, the stock market, uh, wages. Eh? They are all dropping. Um, and the Greeks people are not used to that. Normally, eh? when you have a crisis, they print and prices continue to go up like we have today in the US and Europe. Uh, but more in Europe, like prices go up during this crisis, you know. But in Greece, it's not true. Their prices go down a lot because the euro... Well, they cannot print anything, so um, that's the problem. So what they want is 
this to stop uh, a lot of people and just that they um, uh, they rather have inflationary crisis than deflationary yeah? um, so but my prediction and I know it's a prediction is that this is totally overrated eh? this whole story about Europe uh, uh, the eurozone uh, collapsing I, is, I don't believe that chances are even like high for that you know I think chances are very low eh? the the Greece people will not go out of the eurozone I think eh? and tomorrow that can be wrong but mm -hmm. I think that because they um, uh, it would be a total disaster for them Huh? Mm. For them, huh? um, ac actually, they, they are uh, prices go down. That's true, but actually, that's very good for their economy. What uh, that prices are going down. Huh? Um, uh, the fact that they would just default on their bonds uh, for the Greece people would be very good. Huh? Yeah. I mean, that's what they have to do. That's actually huh? what they need to do, isn't it? Because it's clear that they can't pay it. Yeah, of course, it's much better. Um, so, so. Uh, th they know it's good, but it's just yeah painful. Huh? Mm. Interesting. And so um, you mentioned that you'd done some research on Iceland to sort of kind of get a sense of what would happen if there was a catastrophic currency event. Um, and um, I wonder, you know, just supposing that um, that it did go the way that Greece drops out, and then perhaps some of the other Portugal, Ireland, um, Spain, you know, these kind of countries that they maybe drop out as well, you know, leaving some sort of core, uh, you know, what do you see happening to your investment portfolio if that, if that takes place? Uh, I don't know very well. Um, uh, what I think is that um, uh, at one point it could be good eh, because indeed if these, the, what happens today is that the, the ECB needs to print a lot of euros today to buy Greece bonds. Yeah, eh? yeah, and, and that, and, Greek. Uh, yeah. yeah so 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 that can stop then eh? because Greece is out so they don't need to print more money uh, mm -hmm. to buy those bonds uh, so that would be good also well um, I would hold German bonds eh? so um, let's say that's still from the euro of course then um, it, it might go up but it might also go down because the markets are selling euros because it's too much crisis you know that's hard to predict but indeed it doesn't matter what way it goes. If it goes the Iceland scenario, indeed, eh, mm. um, then uh, the, my gold eh, will rescue me. Um, but if it goes to a, let's say, Great Depression scenario with true deflation, eh, mm. uh, in the 30s, gold didn't go up yeah. uh, a lot, uh, especially at the start. Eh, but bonds went up a lot mm. eh, because the interest rates went, went down. So that can happen here, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I guess in a sense, you know, that's one of the reasons why you have a defensive portfolio in, in there is because it's so hard to tell what's going to happen that you, you're kind of hedging for any one of these circumstances to take place. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I would like to also uh, talk about something else that I think is very important for the permanent portfolio, sure. and that is true inflation. I think this is in the PP community also underestimated, true inflation. Eh? Mm. So. The, P the PP in the US has now 9% on average, uh, uh, about 9, 10, mm. eh? 9, let's say. Um, but what's the true inflation? I think in the US, it's 7. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that means you have 2% real return on average with yeah. the PP, which is good, but it's not a lot. Um, if you want to eh, live financially independent, I listened to your podcast also, Jake, yeah. uh, about that one, which is very good. But if you do your calculations, like if you can just just uh, spend 2% of your capital, you need a lot of capital yeah, to be financially free. Yeah, eh? yeah. So, 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 and that's the same in the Eurozone. We have on average 6%, but true inflation is here also 5%. Mm -hmm. It's a little less, but it's still 5 eh? And so our returns are also only 1, 2, let's say 2% on average per year. Eh? Yeah. And, and so... The thing is, that's why I also speculate, you know, why I also do something next to the PP, why I also take my chances. Because if you take into account true inflation, there is a big difference between having 10% or 9% per year or 13% or, or, or per year. Eh? Mm. Because in America, if you have 9% per year, true inflation 7, you only have 2. But if you succeed in having 13% per year on average, which 
some people can. Huh? You don't have 2% per year, you have like plus 4, so you have 6. Huh? Mm. So you have three times more capital you can spend, and that's like, <laughs> for me, important. Yeah, um, yeah sure. But, so it, it is absolutely true that, you know, we do know that um, the uh, official inflation statistics really don't mean very much in terms of what you actually face um, in in buying things and surviving and living and having purchasing power. And consequently, if you're barely above treading water, then if you really do want to be financially free, yeah, you, 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 know, it, you, you need a, something that works harder than a purely defensive strategy, potentially. Yeah, but you can do this. You can say, okay, all my savings, I do a defensive strategy, and next to that, I, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, eh? mm. for example. Yes. Then you take your chances, you take your chances, but just not with your savings or only a little bit that you put in the business, but, but you do take your chances. You can do that. Eh? Absolutely, yeah. And in, uh, entrepreneurship uh, itself is, um, you know, is a very risky business. Yeah. That's why it has a potentially high return as well. Yeah, indeed. But you could also do it differently because I don't agree that, like, you could also say, look, I'm not, an, I'm not going to be an entrepreneur starting a business, but I'm going to be an entrepreneur with my money. Mm. Eh? I'm going to become a true speculator, a true investor, you know, and uh, because actually it's the same. Yeah. Eh? Uh, you can also during crisis, they say for entrepreneurship, you have a lot of opportunities, eh? and that's true. Eh? Mm -hmm. But it's also in the world of investing. In crisis, you have a lot of opportunities, yeah? Mm -hmm. and there is a lot of money to be made during yeah. crisis. Because indeed, most entrepreneurs during crisis lose because they are old entrepreneurs, eh? um, and only like very innovative uh, uh, people that have a vision. Uh, they do can get off the ground eh? mm. because the market is shifting means uh, the needs are shifting and so new entrepreneurs do get a chance because people are sick of these expensive other companies yeah, you know sure, sure. but the same is true in the world of investing you know mm. uh, money is shifting the market is sick of all those assets real estate uh, stocks there and even bonds now they're sick of it you know yeah, well, that's that's fascinating. I, I really appreciate you sharing your experiences. Um, you know, investing um, as a private investor in the European um, Community. Lastly, Mark, um, just to finish up, um, I think it would be really interesting for people who are not going to be able to invest um, in a fund. You know, who wouldn't have necessarily that level uh, to invest. But you know, the other thing that you've done is you've very much taken your investment.